So, uh, so speaking of irresponsible uh, real estate developers, um, in addition to being a, a, a water manager, I'm a bit of a political junkie. So after we all watched the debate on Sunday, I went back to my room and I was um, looking at all the... <laughs> Well, looking at all the, the post-debate analysis and, and the kind of early consensus was that it was a tie, which struck me as ridiculous. Um, but actually it was a really important object lesson in the role and the power of confirmation bias. That we saw, I saw somebody lying, somebody selling facts, somebody giving one perspective that it seemed reasonable and one that was uh, bravado. Um, and so that was rattling around in my head. I was just thinking about interactions between water managers and scientists, and particularly um, this sort of set piece speech that you'll hear from water utility folks um, that sort of is the, is the preface before any conversation about uh, integrating science and, and a policy. And it usually, and it, this is, varies of course, but it usually starts with the fact that um, impressing upon the scientists that water utilities have to be 100% reliable, that if there's any disruption, it's an immediate and catastrophic uh, public health emergency. Um, they'll tend to, tend to kind of go on about how many hundreds or thousands of miles of very expensive, often very old, slowly rotting infrastructure they have to maintain. Um, and uh, that uh, there are huge capital costs just to maintain that, to say nothing of expanding it or modifying it. It's extremely difficult to raise rates. Um, people care about water. There's usually some side comment about the fact that people seem to be just fine paying $200 for their cable bill, but not enough for their water bill. Um, and that they live in mortal fear of a main break or one bad lab result. And the thing about that speech, and I suspect many of you have heard, if you've interviewed water managers, variations on that, um, is there probably the, the speaker has said it so many times, it becomes kind of rote, and the recipient may not really understand, I think, um, what's, what's being conveyed is essentially a plea for understanding of that manager's constraints. Um, and and, and in there, by omission, um, that science, at least direct science, may play a bit role in that kind of decision making. Um, so it can set up this sort of dynamic where every party in that transaction hears what they want to hear and not really get to really what are the opportunities um, for science to have a larger role in water management. And, and it's a paradox because, you know, obviously, um, global change is a huge problem and it has massive, direct, demonstrable impacts to the water sector. Um, but water resource issues are kind of by definition um, political, right? You know, one definition is the allocation of scarce resources and that's a huge piece of, of what's done. So I, I, I want to preface those comments that way and not to, not to, to take umbrage with anything that really has been said. I, I, uh, I'm a staunch advocate of um, evidence-based decision-making, pushing that wherever I can within my own organization, advocating for it, um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be a cheerleader for the kind of boundary-spanning work that's, that's done. But, but I want, uh, I've been frustrated, and some of it's come up in this setting so far, and hopefully we can work through some of it, about maybe p talking a bit past each other about what the nature of the opportunities, which are always site specific, always specific to the utility in, in uh, the specific city, the region, whatever it is, um, but making sure that we're not, uh, that we're truly hearing each other about the, the space around where that can happen. So let me give an example. I'll try to try to follow the rules a bit. Um, we're currently we're, I'm currently working um, in a planning effort in the western part of the Phoenix metro area, and it happens to be in an area, kind of exurban, uh, small and medium-sized communities that were at the forefront of the housing uh, bu bubble, and then of course had catastrophic impacts when it when it burst. Um, and they got a, a million dollar um, grant from the Bureau of Reclamation through the um, WaterSmart Initiative uh, Basin Study. Um, and uh, 
like, like all of those sort of studies, and there's a, there's a bunch of them now, they have a kind of a similar scope. It's a supply and demand Im imbalance, and by the way, I don't think there is such a thing. Um, uh, climate change, and in this case, um, a focus on uh, integrating some groundwater models so they could uh, evaluate the impacts of groundwater, which is a huge portion of the supply and also a long-term um, uh, concern in the area about overdraft, subsidence, uh, fissuring, that, that kind of thing. So this is a, a group of about a dozen uh, entities. There's some private utilities as well as public ones, but it's mostly, mostly public folks. And they got this two-year grant, and um, we weren't involved at, in, at the early stage. They managed to burn through two years um, without getting really this first step done, supply and demand. Um, what they'd proposed was actually kind of shockingly rudimentary. And I don't mean that to be disparaging about any of the groups that were involved, but you'll, you'll find that that's often the case that supply demand modeling at the, on, the, on the human side, particularly on the demand side, is not nearly as sophisticated in some respects as it needs, needs to be, given the complexity of the underlying demographics, economics, the transportation corridors, all those things. Um, they had basically, they'd been kicking around this one number that they'd been selling to their, to their city councils um, 800,000 acre feet of future demand, which is like an astronomically huge amount um, relative to the whole Phoenix metro area. And the nature of the number, uh, it would make the three foot uh, sea level rise number that, uh, that uh, VR was talking about yesterday look like cutting edge science. It was just like one number multiplied by a number. So we happen, my group happened to have developed some regional scale modeling for our own purposes, but also wanted to be engaged more in these, in these efforts and have been now, and have sort of been able to catch them up because we have a model that can look at all of the supplies and all the demands and incorporate um, lots of change. This modeling is really designed around doing scenario work. Um, the fact that um, the, the demand pieces have been poorly characterized turns out to be particularly important for this region because it's the their future is going to be highly determined by the rate of growth as well as the character of it. Is it going to continue to be kind of a new urbanism, in which case it won't sprawl out into these areas, or is it going to be, going to be disparate? And what, what our modeling did was through, I was at very simplistic kind of scenario planning, expose that group, walk them through a bit more of the potential range of futures they might have. Now, this is, this is, I'm not talking about really mom and pop utilities. I'm talking about fairly established, pretty good sized cities um, that really ha hadn't gotten out of their comfort zone to be able to do that. Now, I still know that they're going to end up with one number. That one number is going to be the number that they want to advocate, which is the combination of all of the kind of the worst case. Maybe it's the worst case, maybe it's not. It's the one that generates the highest future demand so that they can sell it to their economic development folks. But when we think about the opportunities for science, and perhaps particularly climate science, to be interjected into that, there are places. So we are incorporating, at least at some level, um, climate scenarios relative to shortage on the Colorado River system, local increases in t ET, changes in the groundwater flux. There are places, real science is being incorporated at a, at a modest level. But the overall setting, the, the decision space and the factors that will drive their future may not really be that closely coupled to, to questions that are tied to the kind of science we've been talking about so far. And that's not a, it's not a, it's not a reason not to do it. It's not a reason not to push it. It's not a reason not to expand the um, opportunity. And in the last 10 years, there's no question the appetite for that kind of climate work, the impacts, folks want to know. But it may not be the thing that is the most important factor, and it will, and it will always be constrained by the set of things that make the water utility sector particularly conservative in terms of its decision making and how it needs to incorporate uh, new, new 
ideas and new science. <laughs> yeah, <wait on. laughs> so it sounds like a, an opportunity for a different kind of science, one that is more about the demand. Yeah, yes? and so that would be people. That would be social science. Do you have room for that? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, a, as a corollary to that, so we, there is a lot of work, and um, you know, I, I'm intentionally being provocative, obviously, um, but we, to improve part of our model, we had a, a contract out to a, a, it's a consultant, but a former academic who'd done a lot of this work, and really kind of drilling into how utilities model supply and demand, uh, demand in particular, particularly on the residential side. And um, so we were able to make our model a little bit more sophisticated in, in that respect as well. Um, but multiple times through this contract, which is really sort of to advise us how to improve our own, our own capabilities, we ran up into these, these situations where we felt like, surely we're not on the cutting edge of this. Surely these are solved known things. And the short answer is not as many of them are well articulated in economics, in social science, in uh, even on the engineering side, then um, you would hope, given the incredible magnitude of, of uh, investments that are going into infrastructure and decision making. Can I do a follow-up on that question? So just to, to answer it, so the reason that you have climate science to go into the supply side is because we have decided that is important and we've actually invested in that. The reason you don't have cutting edge, demographic, economic, behavioral science to put into this is because we think that's not important. That's the problem that I was trying to argue about the other day, that we need to actually agree that that is important, put money there so that we can actually have the capacity in the social science community to provide not information, but also people skilled at interacting with water utilities, which their that capacity is rather small. Can I just make a follow-up comment to that? So, I guess I want to place this in the context of the charge a little bit, which is to, part of which is to develop integrated knowledge. And so I, I, I gather the point is it's kind of hard to develop integrated knowledge when one part of that integrated knowledge is small. But the goal is still integrated knowledge. Yeah. So there's symbiotic. Can I follow up on that follow-up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think that. You have Okay, so that was fascinating, and you know, the I would suggest that it, it it's possible that demand projections out in a climate change time scale will be as resistant to solid understanding, even with social science applications, as many other areas that we're talking about are going to be resistant. Um, the history of demand projections for water utilities in the last ten years is a not even a checkered one; it's a it's a terrible one. Um, Seattle has a great chart. You know, here's the demand 10 years ago they were looking at. Here's the demand five years ago they were looking at. Here's today, here's the demand now. I mean, it goes down from where it is. And LA is a great example of, I don't have the numbers, but if they grew by 8 million people, they shrunk by, you know, hundreds of thousands of acre feet in demand through conservation. Now, at some point, conservation will reach its limit. My question for you is, in, in San Francisco and other places, we don't have an incentive to to inflate future demand. We have an incentive to deflate it because it costs money uh, to meet this, these, these growing numbers. So I think, I'm, I think I know the answer, but I want to ask why is it that Phoenix wants to pump up these numbers the way they, the way they do? And, and I guess to make it relevant to this, what is, how, does that, how does that answer fit into the climate conversation that we're having here? Yeah, so uh, it's good because uh, I think the thing about incentives is, is, is critical. The planning, planning is done for multiple multiple reasons, often in a kind of a pseudo or, or straight on regulatory purpose in which there's an advantage to um, capturing more. So if you are doing a groundwater flow model and you're trying to demonstrate your 100 year supply, you want to be able to essentially allocate that through a, a an slightly inflated projection. But more generally, um, the, the perception has been um, you don't want to be the guy that gets caught short. And so while it's not a, a, an intentional, uh, you know, 
true high bias, there's, there's an embedded rationale for hedging high in all of, in all of the projections. And then the, just um, to some extent it reflects uh, laziness about the phenomena you've, talk, you've talked about, which I think is uh, starting to be better understood about what's been happening with demand, particularly across the West, um, but really, really nationally as uh, the plumbing code has changed, as tastes and preferences have changed. It's a complex combination of um, engineering and tastes and preferences and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I think there, the reasons that the communities want to show um, growth is because that's their, um, their self-image of what their community wants to be. They see themselves as as growing up into something other than just bedroom communities. And they have, they have stranded assets. They've got infrastructure, they've bonded through uh, on transportation, lots of other things where they need to be able to recoup some of that. Uh, thanks for this fascinating talk and uh, great panel uh, on the whole. I, I wanted to uh, call out something that I thought sounded like a little bit of a, a a threat and, and a, um, uh, a conflict that we might want to all talk about, and that is, you said at one point, um, almost uh, offhand, that you were a proponent of evidence-based decision making, which is great, which I think is probably the default for most decision making. It's it's what we would argue, I think, historically, is um, what science is supposed to um, help make happen. But with climate change, it seems like. Um, there is an inherent conflict in that we have to start looking towards forecasts and scenarios. But we don't spend a whole lot of time dealing with the cultural and governance norms that these decision-making bodies operate under in order to enable them to incorporate those forecasts and scenarios in ways that um, enable rapid enough change. And I, I, I'm just positing that as a question, and I don't know if you want to comment on it or if anybody else to, does. but. Um, but, I, but I think it's something that we should maybe begin to wrestle with a little bit because we're talking a lot about the role of science in decision making and we're not talking about the capacity of the system, systems that we're intending to influence to incorporate new kinds of information. It's a perfect segue to a local scale yeah, we're implementation not of real decision making. Um, so I'm going to take that one because I think that's for everyone and you like your absolute. But we do have two more clarifying? I have a clarifying okay. question. Sorry about that. So and it, it actually is related to what Susie and David said, but it's really for Ken. Um, and that is that I think what you're talking about is the politics of Arizona, right? And so the social science that Susie is advocating for, which I agree with, and what Adam clarified, which is it's really integrated research to answer some big questions. What you're talking about, I think, is the intersection of development investment, which is baked into city planning in Phoenix anyway, everywhere, um, and the reality of environmental change and stuff. So is that what you're talking about? So if we're going to try to do social research to understand demographics better, economic development models that are more sustainable, all that kind of crap, what we're getting into is the actual reality of science intersecting politics, right? <laughs> Not to lead you into a question. <laughs> <to an answer. laughs> well, so, so the description I gave in the fall was, was clearly contextualized to where um, a high growth uh, metropolis, uh, uh, part of the United States that's been growing historically at uh, near the top of the uh, top of the growth rate. And that is clearly not the case in all, all communities, but many of the issues are the same relative to the constraints facing um, uh, water utilities in terms of what they have to do to be able to make changes. And I think that that may be a, a more important point than um, the the nature of what happens in the West Valley of Phoenix. The 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 big P politics and the role that that plays in decision making, it, I, I don't have a, whole, a lot of experience outside of um, my, own, my own experience. Um, politics plays that role everywhere, yeah. right? Exactly. The, the, the poor people are going to get flooded, right? <laughs> right? Well, that's so, my point, though, is that it's not, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's my point is that we're talking about in values and investments. People are invested in a certain answer to that question. Right? So what you said in response to David's question, you know, there's a certain amount of investment in that answer of demand. We want, we're aspirational, right? Right. So, so the <clears throat> place where I see some intervention in that is just to pivot a bit around that. And the specific example I'll give, you know, 
the West Valley communities, they all want to see these high growth scenarios. But I said, well, you know, you may, that may not be the future. We're not going to say whether it is or not, but we're going to run this scenario where it's lower growth and, and folks living more downtown, like we've actually been seeing. They don't have to believe it, and belief really shouldn't be the metric, but it, it, it inches towards maybe uh, exposing a slightly different kind of um, future. So I, I'd like to put a slightly different spin on this because um, actually when people overestimate their demand, that is what you want them to do in a risk-based scenario. In other words, if they underestimate their demand, they're actually at more risk than if they overestimate. And the reason that they do this, which is so puzzling to David, is that there is no opportunity cost. In fact, as you pointed out, there's actually an economic advantage to get grabbing a larger slice of what is a free pie right now. And so, um, you know, obviously, the, going back to the incentives of the individuals, where essentially the normal thing to do is to impose, you know, a, a logical thought process based on facts and evidence in our experience in some other water utility on this situation. Well, the Arizona situation is nothing like the San, you know, the, the San. Already there to yeah, this is not about infrastructure investments. And actually, um, you know, I'm actually helping to run uh, a parallel exact same project in Tucson with the, that Ken's involved in. And I actually have a water utility that wants to underestimate um, the future demand simply because they want to project the existing trend because that's what their that's what their plan says. But in reality, if you're doing risk-based decision making, which we're trying to encourage them to do, you have to be careful about that. So I just wanted to I, I think we're I know we have some other questions, but we're gonna move on to Ashley and then we'll